How's it going guys? Slightly different style of video today. I recently went on JF's live stream. If you don't know who JF is, I will link to the full live stream in the description. He's a relatively large nationalist YouTuber. We discuss things like nationalism in Australia, the Australian nationalist movement, African gangs, the recent rally in St. Kilda, and all the fake news around that. I'm just going to show you that video today, just condensing it to my part specifically. Just wanted to let you know I was quite nervous when I went on this show because he is a very large YouTuber. So I made a few minor errors. It doesn't detract from the content all that much. Hope you enjoy it. Leave a comment if you did. Leave a like. Share it around if you want to. And here it is. All right, joining us, uh, our friend, and I don't know, are you um, are you anonymous or, or not? Uh, so I don't even know how to introduce you. Uh, I'm not anonymous. You can call me Maddie. All right, so you are Maddie, and you are from Australia. Uh, yep. Can you take our audience through what you do uh, so that they get to know you? Okay, so I'm a, I guess, just a YouTube slash internet content creator. I also write articles for a website called XYZ, which is kind of a glorified blog, but we also discuss news and current affairs and all that kind of thing. I have my own main channel, which is called Maddie's Modern Life, which is basically a political commentary channel, plus I discuss philosophy and economics and a few other things. And I've got a second live stream channel where I do a live stream once a week at... 9 15 australian eastern time every mondays just with my friend and colleague david hiscox who edits xyz known as the xyz live stream it's essentially a headline webcast where we go over whatever we want to talk about from the week and just say our piece and take questions from the audience and things like that yeah perfect so we'll be uh, putting links to uh, all of this in the description uh, so you are from Australia. We can recognize this from your accent. And there's lots of action uh, politically in Australia. A lot of people are writing to me about it. And I'm sorry, I can't cover it in super details because I just don't know. I don't know these people. I don't know if there's a rise of nationalism in Australia. But with you, Matty, I think that we can get a good update to understand what's going on. Uh, is there nationalist activity that is... Uh, more than normal in Australia right now? There's a growing nationalist movement in the country, as with as with the rest of the the world. I was <laughs> That's all right. we our mainstream media are obviously pro globalist, so you won't get all that much coverage of it. I mean Australia is actually got a sort of a nationalist founding to it. A lot of people don't realise this, but Australia was founded as a white ethno state. It was founded specifically for that purpose, but this is just a fact that obviously our ruling class just keep hidden from us and have kept hidden from us for, for quite a while. In terms of nationalist movements itself, there are a number of different groups doing different things throughout the Australian political landscape at this point in time. I, I think you may have heard of Lad Society. Have you ever heard of them? Lad Society? No, I never heard. So Lad Society are a community group, essentially. So they're just a community of, of men. So it's basically a men's club, well, a, a boys' club in in one sense, but it's also a community group in another in that we are unified by our desire to make Australia a better place and restore it to its founding principles. Um, there's also a number of other groups that are a little bit more underground as well. So, I mean, Australians are quite anti-immigration just in general. Like a polls show about 50 to 65% of people want cuts to immigration in our country. In terms of organised movements and big political parties, we've got One Nation who are currently polling at about 8 to 9% of the vote. They have a few seats in the parliament. 
uh, Pauline Hanson made headlines about 20 years ago saying that Australia was going to be flooded by Asians. And obviously she was called a racist bigot, et cetera, et cetera. And turns out she was 100% right. Although she sort of toned down the rhetoric a little bit. She's gone a little bit softer on it. Whilst, while she's done that, other people have moved into the more hardline anti-immigration, uh, constitutional pro-white Australia policies, um, that sort of, that people have moved into that sort of area within the community. And we now have a, a politician called Fraser Anning who made waves around the world actually when he, in his maiden speech, called for a final solution to the immigration problem in Australia, which his solution was a plebiscite on who was going to come to this country. And obviously the media and the establishment tacked on to the two words they used, calling him holiday names and and whatnot, but essentially it just uh, gave him exposure and won him a lot of support. He, yeah, Fraser Durating came to this rally that we had in St Kilda last week as well, and he was attacked by the media for that. So there, there's, there's quite a lot of movement in the Australian nationalist movement. It's not a widespread thing at the moment. Uh, it, it does have mostly most community support. There's a lot of support for it within the community, but we're not ready to go and stick on our yellow vests and tear down monuments. Very interesting. I see the data right here. Chinese Australians constituted 5.6% of the Australian population and Indian Australians 2.8%. Those are big numbers for Asian uh, minorities in white countries. And I guess it poses a different problem. In many white nations, you have people saying, the immigrants uh, should be avoided because they might not be economically efficient. They might have lower IQ than your average population. They might be committing more crimes. I'm getting, I'm guessing that the Asian populations of Australia are not causing such trouble, but that it is a trouble in terms of the mass that they accumulate demographically within Australia. Yeah, that's correct. So whilst the numbers are two and five or whatever the numbers you say, I think 5% is for Asians and what, two to 3% for Indians. The vast majority of those people come to Melbourne, which is where I live, and Sydney, which is the biggest city in the country. A big problem that they are bringing, especially the Indian migrants, is that they are low-skilled workers and they tend to suppress Australian wages. Now, I drove Uber for, for two years and... When I first started, you could make a, a decent living out of it, but we got a lot of subcontinenters in and they took those jobs and they, they started flooding the market in Uber. And, and now it's it's very difficult to make more than minimum wage. You can make okay money on a Saturday night if it's a decent Saturday night, but you can't make that kind of money anymore. But that's just one example. It, it, it's happening across a number of industries where Asian low-skilled Asian migrants are coming from the subcontinent and taking Australian low-skilled workers and, again, suppressing our wages. In terms of the Chinese, that's a slightly a different issue in that uh, we got they, they're buying up a lot of our property, pushing property prices up and keeping our housing ponzi inflated. And, again, it's like you said, it's a, it presents much more of a, a demographic replacement problem then um, it, it, it's still a demographic replacement problem, I should say, in that a lot of them are coming in, they're creating congestion, and especially people coming from the Chinese mainland may not necessarily be loyal to the nation of Australia. Uh, we even have, we, we now have a big issue with Chinese spy intelligence and and things like that, potentially doing a lot of damage to Australia, sort of behind the scenes um, they even send spies into universities where there's a lot of Chinese students just to make sure the Chinese students aren't saying things about the communist government while they're over here so th th there's a number of different issues for Australia it's, it, it, it seems to me like every western nation has a similar problem but depending on the region they are in the world it's it's sort of very slightly uh, very interesting. I'm looking at the data here. It, there's a big problem because in China, there is up to 33 million men that don't have a woman. There's 33 million more men 
than women. And if you include India, there's 50 million excess males. They find themselves in a country where they know if they are at the bottom of the social ladder, there is no future for them. They will end up in old age. They will not have a reproductive life. They will not find a wife. So these people find themselves either living a life of work and pleasure, uh, of some kind of survival while resigning any any sort of continuation in the world, or they look for immigration opportunity in countries that have maintained an equilibrium between male and female is because all of this is a result of the uh, child policies of China, which led to a sexual preference in parents who they preferred having a male than a female. But then they're stuck in a world where males cannot reproduce, and it leads to the exportation of of a lot of people who are, as you say, low skilled and they they have no hope in their own country. So it's a form of refugee, but it's it's not like a refugee from war. It's a refugee from a sexual market that is absolutely wild. Yeah, it's it, it is a problem. Uh, it's a big problem for China actually, uh, because obviously they can't send everyone overseas. And I'm sure you've seen that they've got this new social credit system where people at the bottom are basically shut out of everything. I think the Chinese government are insane, uh, given what you just said, uh, that is in implementing this social credit system because we've already got an, a large number of men who are basically never going to have a wife and never going to have children. And now they've got the social credit system, which is alienating a number of people even further. And you could potentially have a situation in China where there are tens, if not hundreds of million of, of people who have no investing, have no investment in, in the Chinese system. Now, I, actually, I grew up in China. So I spent a number of years there when I was younger. Uh, not actually China. I was in Hong Kong. So it was controlled by the British. It's slightly different, but you get a much better taste of what it's like over there. A lot of what you see in the media coming out of China, it's just, it, it's rubbish. Like China control so much information coming out of their system, like coming out of their country. I suspect a lot of the econ economic strength of the last couple of decades has waned over there. And I don't, I, I think this is a lot of the reason for Chinese military expansion, especially in the Pacific, in that they've kind of woken up to the fact that their economy isn't as strong as it could have been or should be if they want to continue the growth and continue keeping their society stable. So they are now expanding elsewhere. Now, in my home state, in Victoria, our Premier just signed on to the Chinese Brick Road Initiative where the Chinese Communist Party are building infrastructure around the world. And it's a fairly insidious little program where they get countries locked in to horrendous terms for loans and then what they go then essentially the Chinese Communist Party comes in and takes it over so it's just a backdoor form of Chinese imperialism and that's a, it's actually a really big threat for Australia because the Chinese government through proxy corporations are purchasing quite a lot of China, of Australian agriculture not just okay. property but Australia yeah so it, it is it is a big issue and I just don't see our any of our major parties in federal government being able to or being strong enough or willing enough to actually do something meaningful about it. All right, very worrying. Uh, I'm looking at the St. Kil Kilda coverage. And to be honest, people were asking me to cover this story and I wanted to cover it. But at the same time, it, it's hard to find trustable media in Australia. And so I, I find myself just looking at mainstream media article and it doesn't seem like it represents the reality on the ground. So can you hmm. take us through what happened at St. Kilda? People are well, characterizing this as a far-right rally with potential violence. Um, I actually did a full vlog on it. I did it. It's on my main channel, Maddie's Modern Life. It's the latest video I published. I'm, I've got a new video scheduled to publish at 2 p.m. today as well, where I go over all the the lies from the mainstream media. So if you want a full breakdown of it, you can go and check that there later, obviously. Just to give you the rundown now, it was originally just a rally of people who are fed up with a number of the issues of multiculturalism and mass immigration in Australia, especially 
African crime. So we brought over a large number of South Sudanese and Somalians as well, but mainly South Sudanese to Australia as refugees about probably about 15 years ago. And we've been experiencing the results of that refugee program ever since. So what they'll do, they'll hang out obviously in large groups. They go down to St Kilda Beach where this rally was and they'll harass people, they'll harass beachgoers, but it's not just St Kilda Beach, it's further south in Chelsea Beach and they'll go into the city. Uh, it's all through the northern suburbs of Melbourne and it's not just Melbourne either, it's also in Perth. Uh, I believe there's a, a number of issues in Perth, I'm not sure how much of an issue it is in Sydney, but mainly Melbourne and Perth are where I, I, I believe are the main issues for African crime. So this St Kilda rally was, aside from all the things of multiculturalism and mass immigration, was predominantly about the effects of this African crime. And people were just frankly sick of it. So we've gone down there, a number of people, a guy, one, one of the most prominent figures in the nationalist movement, a guy called Blair Cottrell, did he a speech. Neil Erickson, who is also well known in the nationalist movement, also did a speech. He actually organised it. Now these two individuals have checkered pass, but I've met them both, and they're both nice enough people. Blair has had issues in the past. They both paid their dues to society. Blair actually got convicted of blasphemy, essentially. Oh, yeah. He, yeah, he. Um, that's another story. We can talk about that another time. But anyway. The, the St Kilda rally, they've spoken about African crime. They said, we want answers, et cetera, et cetera, what you would expect from a normal political rally. It was perfectly peaceful. It was probably about 10 to 15. I, I, I estimated about 12 police officers standing around, about 500 people there to listen to speeches, lasted about 45 minutes or thereabouts, and then most of the people went home. However, just about 200 metres away, there was a counter-protest of Antifa, who were essentially communists, who didn't like the fact that we were having a rally to discuss these issues. So they've gone and set up their own counter-protest. They were surrounded by police. They had a whole ring of police all the way around them, spent the whole afternoon just chanting, Nazis go away, you know what they do, they did their mindless NPC chants. And a number of people from the main rally that I was at went over there and were sort of yelling at them and, and giving you know, giving them straight back. And then there were a few people who joined in and there were a few people who didn't go to the rally and it ended up being probably about 100 to 200 on each side just yelling at each other for a while. And the police essentially gave the communist protesters an escort to the trains uh, that's basically what happened. There was a large police presence. Uh, might have been a little bit of overkill, but I know I'm not a I'm not a tactical police officer. The point being, if they hadn't turned up, there wouldn't have been any issues. Now the media, just because they're the mainstream media, have seen a number of people doing what they believed were Roman salutes. So one of them was a guy in head who was actually just waving, and they took a still picture, and it looked at him like that. So they said that he was giving a, a Roman salute or Nazi salute, as they say. And then there was another guy who, if, if you've ever seen Faulty Towers, when Basil Faulty, it's a very famous episode where he does the goose step where he's doing one of these. So one of the guys was doing that, walking around, and the media sort of latched onto that and said that it was a rally of far-right, neo-Nazi, crazy people, which wasn't true. Uh, there were a couple of National Socialists in the crowd, but there was only about one or two that I saw. Most of the people were just fed up Australians who are sick of our government not listening to the people. Like I said before, the majority of people, it's actually the vast majority of people want cuts to immigration. So it's 50% to 65% want cuts to immigration, but it's only something like 20 to 25% who don't. I can't remember the exact numbers. So we are speaking for the majority of Australians, but because the media have their globalist agenda to run, they've obviously got to essentially slander the population. Now, there was an actual genuine slander, uh, slanderous article of one of the organisers, of Blair and Neil Erickson, and the actual organisation saying that these people, we were going to start a riot, which was completely untrue. It was always meant to be a peaceful rally, and it was a peaceful rally. Had the communists not turned up, it would have been 
45 to an hour minute of speeches and then everyone would have gone home and that's and that would have been it but because the communists turned up it ended up being nationwide news wonderful well it's good to hear from uh, this uh, and i've referred to your youtube channel i've put it in the regular chat and i've added it to the description so you have a video coming out uh, i don't know in our time what it is but i guess in a few hours from now that's correct all right, perfect. So we will be uh, looking at it. And we have a few reactions from the crowd. Free helicopter rides sends 20 bucks. He says the pseudos in Victoria are violent as shit. I watched an ABC documentary on the youth called The Truth about American crime in Melbourne, Four Corners, making gangster rap based on American culture. How bad are the crimes? In terms of the Sudanese? They are very vastly overrepresented in crime in crime statistics. Think about Australia is our government doesn't actually keep specific crime data on ethnicity. They only do it by oh. country of birth. And if you have a look at country of birth, Sudanese are something like they're, they're in, in just general crime, they're about 10 times more likely to commit just crime in general, but that includes non-violent crime like you know, even speeding fines and all that kind of stuff. However, when you control for just violent crime, they make up about 0.1% of the Australian population and they commit, I think it's between 4 and 6% of, of violent crime. So things like aggravated burglary, assault, right in a fray is a big one. They're big on right in a fray and aggravated burglary, so where they... They commit a home invasion. There's been a large number of home invasions committed by the Sudanese community in Australia over the last five years. Uh, there's been also, like I said, a number of brawls. About uh, that's probably six months ago, there was a, a major brawl in an inner city Melbourne suburb between about 100 Sudanese youths and youths, youths they call them youths, in Collingwood against a number of Islander men. So Islanders are people from the Pacific Islanders, uh, from the Pacific Islands. So the crimes they're committing are quite violent. They, they're they often violent. And I'm actually doing another story. I just finished another video on something that happened over in Perth where a family actually got bashed. Now, the, the media didn't actually mention the the ethnicity of the, of the people, but we, we have sources to say that they were of African appearance. So it, it, it is an issue. It, it is a, a pretty big issue and it's it, it's very public and it's very well known. And people are, are quite fed up, especially because the government just won't do anything about it, it seems. They, they, they won't arrest these people. A lot of them get arrested and then they just get released back into the public. Uh, what I think we need to do is to arrest them and just send them back to the Sudan if they are found guilty of any kind of violent crime. So any of the ones that I mentioned before, any assault, any, any kind of violent offence, they should just be sent back home along with their entire family. And that, that will solve the problem very quickly. All right. Gary says, Sydney is generally peaceful, but there is no multicultural integration and massive amounts of white flight. Our European heritage is eradicated and we are becoming another Western multiplex city. That's a, a good description of what's happening, right? Yeah, so I'm Melbourne through and through. I've never lived in, in Sydney. Uh, so I can comment on what Melbourne is like. Uh, in, in terms of Sydney, they, they have quite a large Middle Eastern population as well. Don't know if you saw, but Lauren Sullivan came to Australia and she tried to go through Lakemba and was actually asked to leave because uh, it was a she was going to cause an imminent breach of the peace, mm -hmm. according to the uh, <laughs> according to the the police officer there who was a very high ranking police officer. He, I can't remember what rank he was, but he was a very high ranking police officer. Just told her to leave. In Melbourne, we in terms of demography, we have a very large number of Asian individuals who especially are congregating around the CBD. If you go to the CBD, I mentioned before that I lived in Hong Kong as I was as a child. I go to the CBD and it looks and smells just like Hong Kong in a lot of the places. Like you walk through and not even in Chinatown, you just walk, wow, this smells just like the place that I grew up. And it's almost entirely, like the vast majority of people there are, are Asians. And 
especially and then they sort of snake out to the eastern suburbs where there's another suburb called Box Hill, which was traditionally a Cantonese suburb, but they spread out from there. So we have a large number of, of especially Chinese immigrants coming to Australia and also a large number of Indians. Where the Sudanese are and the Middle Eastern community, they tend to be out in the western and northwestern suburbs of Melbourne. And you see, they tend to have a lot of problems. I believe in St Albans, I think that's the suburb. There's there's a, a shopping centre, and if you go out into the west, you just go through, and there's there's a whole load of Sudanese people, and I would imagine they're having quite a lot of issues out out there too. So, in terms of dem demographic replacement, it's very obvious when you're living in the city, especially when you go to certain areas where there are ethnic enclaves being set up. Actually, another one I should mention. Sorry before before I finish the point, is that there's another suburb in Sp called Springvale in Melbourne southeast where a lot of Sudanese are living now. So that used to be a very safe area, but you wouldn't walk through that area at night alone anymore, especially not if you were a female, because it's just not safe. And that's that's Danny Nong, especially Danny Nong South, I believe. All right, Bragster on the regular chat says CBD equals Central Business District. I knew it. I didn't need that specification. I know Australia. <laughs> Alpha New America says, My grandfather was the director of general foreign intelligence in Australia, ONA. He was worried about the Chinese immigrants. Chinese are colluding with government rent seekers, draining our aquifers. What's an mm -hmm. aquifer? I believe it's uh, just a dam. I'm like, I'm not. Oh, okay. An ex I think it says like the it's like our water supply. I right, correct me if I'm wrong on that though, but I think that's I what see. he's talking about. Well, uh, Matty, modern life. People will be going to your YouTube channel for your upcoming video, and that will be it for tonight. I thank you so much for coming. It was great to hear about Australia. No worries. Thanks very much for having me.